Okay, so um, yeah, so today I want to just give you a little bit of an outline of you know some of the things that we're trying to do and also some some results. So so far, when we come to publish our information, certainly those that are biomedical scientists, we usually use the data as the basis for analysis. We make our publication and we basically put that data in some supplementary material with no expectation of its potential reuse. But actually, I think the paradigm is changing. The idea here is now. Instead, and particularly in the context of these reproducibility challenges that, uh, that many of us are, are, have sort of identified, is that really the data should be the first class object and the narrative is the second. And, and not only that, but, but not just to tell your story, but that you can use this data in other contexts. You can use it um, uh, to reproduce the, the studies that have been done. You can use it to validate your own research, your own studies, and you can use it to generate new hypotheses. So the challenge is how do we move from this current paradigm of uh, pub publishing your ideas with some data to really using data to generate all kinds of new activities. I think part of the solution is really two twofold. One is to develop infrastructure. I think a lot of us are doing this, right? Methods to an infrastructure to identify, to represent, to store, retrieve, and aggregate, query and analyze data exactly what we saw in the previous presentation, and in a manner using software and services that are reliable and reproducible, right? That we can share these analyses, other people can do it, and they can develop new infrastructure from there. We also need methods that will allow us to report on what we already have, but also discover new, um, a plausible, supported, prioritized, and experimentally verifiable associations. And all this is great, but at the end of the day, it's kind of like the question I was asking, which is you can have the best technology in the world, but you need other people to use it. And we have to develop community to do that. So this is the whole idea behind FAIR, actually, is really to engage the community with a set of very simple principles to sort of drive what do we really need in place in order for us to massively reuse people's content. And so the FAIR principles, right, focusing on the aspects of findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, are really meant to be not just for data, but actually for any digital resource that you would publish on the web, right? So whether that's software, images, web services, scholarly publication, so all should be subject to these fair principles. And in particular, it's not just the data, but as you saw before, also the metadata. The metadata has to be in a, in a format and a, uh, sufficiently described that we can use it to discover your content and to reuse it and make decisions about that. So the nice thing is that the fair principles have been developed sort of in a multi-organizational uh, context. The work started at Lorenz Center in the Netherlands in 2014, and we refined them here in, uh, at the Biohackathon in 2015. And we published our work in 2016. We have now over 200 citations of this paper. It's been included in the G20 uh, communique. It's been endorsed by European Open Science Cloud, H2020, NIH, and so on. So now researchers <laughs> are being faced with, OK, what are you doing to make your stuff fair? And they're looking around, and they're going to blame me and Mark and others um, but hopefully, right, that we're going to help build the infrastructure and the know-how to move the state of the art, to move how we have been doing things for so long, so vastly inadequate, to a whole new paradigm of, of content publishing. Now, of course, here at the Biohackathon, as Toshiaki indicated, is that the Semantic Web really holds a, a special place in our hearts as to how we are going to uh, make this possible. That we, By adopting the technologies, by working within the context of the W3C, we can advance technologies and platforms and infrastructure that we can all share and reuse. And I think the, the value here, of course, is that it's a distributed platform for knowledge sharing, right? And for, for basically uh, establishing standards and reusing them. So this is the exciting thing. And of course, we're building this massive knowledge graph of, of information, highly connected information. You've probably seen this link to a data graph. The portion in the red is the life sciences portion, largely comprised of ontologies, but also of data sets. One of the projects that we have in this space is called BioTrief. This is one that uh, we run, where we take data in its glorious heterogeneity, and we generate linked data out of it and provide it on an online platform. So this is great, and uh, there are billions of statements, and it, we're joined not, so it's not only just BioTrief, but of course we have our partner organizations like EBI and the NCBI and so on, and DDBJ, that are also publishing content in this space. So this is excellent. And of course, we are not the only ones to use companies like Ontoforce and Meadowhome um, create uh, what I would say are killer applications to uh, formulate fairly sophisticated queries using a graphical interface that allow you to do the search, to aggregate, to apply um, these faceted uh, search filters on multiple aspects of your connected data. And that lets you really deep dive into the data without actually knowing the query language itself. So this is extensions of what you would see with Amazon and that sort of thing where you're doing an initial search and you're deep diving now can 
can go on. So this is exciting, but I think the other part, which is really nice, particularly in the context of sort of the fake news crisis, is really where did this content come from? And so in, in products like this, you get to see here all the data sources that were used to generate that content, and they become really immediately visible to you. And I think that's very important, particularly for scientists, for doctors, for others that are really concerned about the source of the information that's being presented to them. Here they can look at it, they can assess it, and then they can decide whether or not to reuse it. Now, of course, data retrieval, data discovery, data retrieval only part of the solution. What we do in our lab is really discovery work. We want to find associations that haven't been reported. Um, so part of that is taking some portion of that graph and transferring it into other modalities that are more useful, let's say, for discovery purposes. And part of that is um, generating, for instance, probabilistic semantic knowledge graphs. We do this work here with um, uh, our colleagues in the U.S. where we transform some portion of the graph um, involving diseases and genes and drugs and try to identify potentially new compounds that could mitigate, for instance, in this case, melanoma, which... Uh, Basically, here we find new drug candidates, and we can examine this against what we know in clinicaltrials.gov and see what stage of these drugs, uh, if any, have been explored to, uh, to use them as a, a feasible treatment. So again, we're just using the information that's already there to generate hypotheses about potential drugs. We also have been participating in a number of different um, machine learning challenges. So for instance, AstraZeneca and Sanger had this sort of combination prediction challenge. Um, through a so-called dream challenge. Again, we use data from BioTDF. We, ex we pull out information regarding um, the drugs, their chemical structures, uh, their targets, pathways, protein domains, interaction networks. This is all already there. We just do queries on our knowledge base, pull that in and combine it with the information that was provided to us, in particular the gene expression profiles of the, the, the tissues. And we basically look at which combinations are synergistic or can uh, basically kill cancer cells. And we learn from that, and we generate new predictions. Now, this is actually a fairly difficult problem. Um, we use a number of different sort of machine learning approaches, uh, and we do uh, OK, but I would say it's still a very, very, very difficult problem, but very, uh, very interesting from our perspective. And so we learn something. Uh, a little bit about what information is useful for making these kinds of predictions, but also the vast gaps in our knowledge about uh, drugs, uh, how they work, and how we can reapply them um, in these contexts. Now, this is all fine. I mean, when you're sort of the owner and developer of a repository of multiple databases all integrated together, like BioTDF, you basically know what information is out there and you know how to pull it out. But the challenge is, actually even today, when I look out and I sort of say, um, you know, what new information has been generated, that's actually fairly difficult to do. And this is really the role of metadata, is that if you can describe your resource and we can index it, then we should be able to find things that we don't know. Um, so this is one of the big challenges, and I, we would argue that high-quality metadata are basically they're essential, they're required for large-scale reuse and, and biomedical discovery. So some of the work that we've done here, or started here, uh, was looking at developing data set descriptions, uh, and this uh, we eventually, so we started this at uh, Biohackathon 13. Uh, we um, developed this data set description um, community profile, which we moved through the W3C and we've published uh, now in PureJ. And this really says here the essential metadata for it, describing a data set uh, involves everything from identifiers, where the home page, licensing, and so on, provide uh, your provenance, versioning, and content metadata. And that's a, a nice thing, and we see adoption uh, in this community and other communities, and that's going to allow us to do indexing of resources that we're not, we don't know, but we potentially could reuse. The other part, too, is not just the data sets, but it's also the APIs. Um, the services that you create also need to be discoverable. It's not just from word of mouth or publications, but how do we massively describe these things so that we can pull them, we can even identify the ones that are relevant for the task at hand. And so there we have done some work. Um, Mark Wilkinson in particular have been, developed this SADI Semantic Web frame, Framework, which really builds on OWL2 ontology descriptions. And more recently with Chen Lei Wu, who's also here, we have been working on a concept called the Smart API. This builds on the Open API initiative and adds a bit more semantics so that we can see what kinds of content your APIs consume and what they produce and how we can connect them together. And importantly, of course, in both of these is that we leverage Semantic Web a little bit here. We really want to see that the content that you produce or you consume are linked to the data sets that we are producing in this open fashion. That you're generating URIs that we can resolve that content and figure out what it is and get more information and more links beyond what your service is giving us back. So remember not to just give us 
uh, if you're building a service, don't just make it a dead end, make an opportunity to learn more things for your algorithms to, to go out and fetch more data. Okay, so what's missing? We, well, we definitely need more success stories about linked data for discovery. Um, and I think that's maybe something that we can try to, um, to develop, particularly for the 10th anniversary paper that will follow this workshop, to really think about how you have used these technologies in your own discovery work or how others have done so and we need to collect these use cases. We need to make it easier to survey, to locate, retrieve, and reuse fair digital resources. I think this means the establishment of new registries for digital resource content standardizing the APIs, but not actually about the, the necessarily the, the, yeah, there are big challenges sort of about the balance between REST APIs and query APIs, and what's the sweet spot there, so there's discussions about that. About dockerizing your content so it's easier for, for other people to deploy it exactly as it works for you. Um, methods to assess the fairness of digital resources, so-called fair metrics, this is something that we've been working on, and Mark Wilkinson and I will be working on this in this workshop. Uh, and also ways to retrieve distributed knowledge expressed using different ontologies and schemas. To that end, we have done some work even also working here uh, called the Semantic Science Integrated Ontology. This is really a high-level ontology for different concepts and relations. It allows you basically the semantic glue to sort of say, here's how my API, for instance, relates to your API, the content that's um, consumed or produced by that, and what you put in your data sets. So this could be the glue that we need to do inter semantic interoperability. Of course, during this workshop, I am always available to provide uh, support and expertise on anything relating to FAIR, ontologies, data and service descriptions, so feel free to reach out to me. Uh, we'll be updating and deploying our BioTDF uh, using Docker on our new infrastructure at Maastricht University. Uh, plan to work on FAIR metrics, uh, also revise the Smart API UI for the V3 of Open API. Uh, Chen Lei will discuss this a little bit. And also explore the use of deep learning frameworks over linked data. And I think this is work with Robert Hundorf, and you'll hear more about that uh, during his talk. Okay, with that, uh, thank you very much.